Today, the frugal repairman is going to try to advance the ball a yard or two down the field. Uh, I realize that <laughs> in the first two segments, I haven't stayed anywhere near my 10-minute goal. So I'm uh, in the uh, the politically correct uh, times. I'm just going to change the goalposts and say, okay, I'll try to stay under 15 minutes or around that. Uh, other thing I thought I might mention is uh, some people have commented on frugal repairmen. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit of a uh, an attempt to to sort of hide the ball to maybe I should have called myself the cheap fixer but then I thought you might confuse me with a New York uh, attorney but uh, where I wanted to go today is really the question of working on a radio without any power now at one point I uh, mentioned that I had cut the cord off of this and I'll talk about why I do that uh, in a little bit but uh, the, the important thing is my philosophy on these, on repairing things, has changed over the years. When I was a young, uh, call me a whippersnapper, I used to get shocked all the time. I, was, I didn't pay much attention to anything like that. Uh, I later was in the military. Uh, I even taught some electronics in the military and I still was not very careful with safety. But, uh, and I certainly had opportunities to, to think about that, but one of the things that uh, I should have paid attention to, I, I uh, once worked with a fellow whose uh, uh, father had been, uh, worked for Con Edison and who was killed when a workman replaced uh, or removed the uh, the safety sign and the interlock from an underground uh, electrical tunnel and uh, his father was working on this uh, at the time the guy turned the power back on because he didn't want to string cables down a manhole and uh, and he was killed now this happened some years before I met this fellow Later, I worked with a guy who only had one arm because he had been working on a BC-610. That's what this transmitter is. What he had done is he had opened the top here. Uh, there is an interlock inside. This, by the way, is just uh, sitting there. It's an antenna tuner. Uh, it's normally not there, at least in a fixed operation. And the, he had removed the top and defeated the interlock. And he was working inside it. Now this guy had some experience. He knew what he was doing, or supposedly. But he managed to get his hand across the RF uh, section and his elbow uh, or arm was leaning on the chassis. And so basically the, uh, the RF ran up his arm and into the chassis. Initially, except for a small burn on his hand, he thought everything was fine. But uh, if, if you don't like grizzly stories you might want to turn mute the volume right now turns out what he had done is cooked the uh, the meat on the bone so that eventually he had to have his arm amputated but the worst situation that happened to me was in a military facility overseas in the 60s uh, where I worked and uh, one mid-morning just before noon there were shouts and screams and people began yelling and running around and it turns out that uh, a young man working in the uh, repair part of this facility had come across the alive 240 volt AC line this was in Europe so it was 240 instead of 120 volts and uh, he died so if I'm biased about uh, <laughs> about safety uh, it, it's it may be that I've just been uh, well I've certainly learned over the years and or maybe I should say I've certainly changed my attitude and so among other things uh, I, I may be overstressed and people uh, sometimes wonder why I preach about this way way more than some of them feel comfortable with but uh, for example in my number 155 I talk about the death difference and I realize that was just a little bit of hype but but it really does make a difference you really can't kill yourself with this stuff 
and the importance of using an isolation transformer like the thing that you see there. Uh, okay, what's all, all that got to do about working on this All-American 5 radio? Well, let me uh, talk about that next. These radios, the All-American 5 and a lot of other gear in this period, were designed to be transformerless. That is, they, they had transformers like this one that's the output transformer, but they didn't have a power transformer. And as a result, one side of the AC line was connected to the chassis of the receiver, either directly or sometimes through a, through a uh, capacitor. And unfortunately, that capacitor was a capacitor type that would fail over time. So it was possible for you to have the uh, chassis of the receiver be uh, hot. Plugs of the day were like this. They had uh, two identical uh, connectors. So you could plug this in this way or reversed this way. And you notice that plugs of the day, they didn't have a ground lead and they uh, these are the same size on both sides. Now today, because we have learned better, plugs have a ground lead. It's, they're called three wire. And you'll notice that one of these is bigger than the other. And the purpose is, although you can plug in an old style both ways into the new uh, sockets, as I'll show you in a second, you can't do that with a modern plug. And the reason is that one of the uh, spades is bigger than the other. That's done so that if you have it properly wired, the, uh, the chassis is not hot. That is, it's, there's no way with a properly wired radio and this kind of plug for you to get the plug-in backwards and therefore uh, create a hot chassis situation. Why is a hot chassis a problem? Because if you get between a hot chassis and a ground of some sort, uh, it can kill you. Okay, so that's why that I cut off these cords. Later, when we get to firing this radio up, we'll talk about the kind of cord we are going to use here and some other things we do to protect two things. People first, equipment second. Okay, so what does all that have to do with the, the subject of this video? Well, it is that I advocate that when you're repairing an old radio like this, that you first do everything you can to test the radio before you plug it in. And to remind you not to plug it in until you have properly equipped it with the right kind of plug and other safety features, I cut the cord off of these All-American 5s especially when I find that the cord is frayed. But even if it's not, any time that I find this kind of plug on an All-American 5, the kind with equal and therefore reversible connections, I cut that cord off because I know that before I replace uh, or put this receiver back into service, I want to wire it so that I, I'm not going to have somebody uh, killing themselves, to be honest with you. Okay, uh, enough about the lecture. What are the kinds of tests that you can do on a receiver like this without putting any power to it? This is a page from the SX-62 service manual. Uh, that's a Helicrafter's receiver, and I did a series on restoring SX-62s. In fact, I restored two of them, uh, if you want to look back. But the main purpose of showing this is to talk about the fact that for many of the old radios, that is, the radios of the 30s and into the 40s, they often included these resistance reading charts at the top is the pin number of the tube. 
on the left is the tube type. So this is a 6C4. It's called uh, item number one, and uh, this is consistent on the schematic as well. And you see on pin one it says 500k ohms, then it has a little asterisk, and I won't talk about that for right now, but basically it shows resistance readings that are taken between pin one and ground, which is the chassis of the receiver. Now, the SX62A has a nice power transformer, so it is isolated, and the ground of the uh, radio, the chassis that is, uh, is completely isolated from the AC line. So the uh, you can do this measurement using an ordinary ohm meter. And I'll take a look at a couple of those in a minute and then we'll kind of wrap this all up. But the whole idea is one of the reasons that I advocate this technique is you can go through and do these resistance readings pretty pretty quickly using just an ordinary multimeter. And if you see something a little unusual, then you know to look in that area of the circuitry to find out if there's anything that needs to be replaced. Now, one of the nice things about tube radios is if you get a high reading, so for example, if this 500K, or better yet, let's use a different one. Suppose that this... Uh, 330 ohm here measures uh, 1.6K, 1600 ohms instead of 3300. You know you have a bad resistor. And the reason is that unlike solid state gear, tube gear is very high impedance. And so it is, uh, and even if it were not, there's no way that a shunt across this 330 ohm resistor can cause its value to go up. Anything you shot across here would cause its value to go down. So here is rule number one in these resistance readings. If you get a value that is more than 10% above this figure, you know that there's a bad resistor in the radio at that location. Okay, maybe I should have said rule zero is you do this with the power off. Cut the cord. And... At some point in this series, we will get to the place where we put the cord back. But for right now, everything we do is going to be without the cord. Now, you might ask, well, what do I do if I don't, if the service literature does not have those resistance readings? Here is a Westinghouse AM FM radio, which also, uh, which I previously did in, uh, let's see. I wrote them up here in my uh, numbers 41, 42, and 43. And also there's a playlist for these. Uh, this is not an All-American 5, but uh, it does have a power supply that connects directly to the AC line you notice that it uses some resistors and other things here, but basically one side of the AC line through this uh, inductor and then through the switch goes to the chassis. And uh, here it's called B minus. So this is one of those dangerous receivers that if you get it plugged in backwards, uh, and you're not using an isolation transformer, it can kill you. For that reason, I would cut the cord off of this one as well before I work on it. But, but where are we going? Okay, what about resistance readings? Well, in many cases, the resistance reading can be found by simply looking at the schematic. Let's take this tube as an example. This audio frequency output tube. Zero in on the... Uh, there we are. On the cathode. You'll notice the cathode has a value of 3.5 volts written on the schematic and a resistor of 150 ohms to ground. So if you insert a test lead into the socket for this tube, 
with one lead connected to ground and the other lead connected to the cathode pin. Then you should read 150 ohms or less. Now I say or less because there may be other circuitry that shunts this. And later when we talk about transformers and things, we'll see that, that often transformers, uh, because they are just a winding of wire, have such low resistance that they do shunt uh, parts of the circuit. But we'll learn about that. At the me in the meantime, the idea is you can go through, and even if you don't have that resistance chart, just by looking at this uh, schematic, you can figure out approximately what the resistance reading should be. Now, the there are a few areas where that's hard to, to determine. For example, over here you have a transformer and these pins don't have any connection to ground except through the center tap of that transformer and then this resistor and eventually I think that goes to the AVC line. Could be wrong. Well see that's all isolated with with capacitors. So okay this is a good example. If you were to measure this point and you got a low resistance to ground, if you follow this through, this resistor is or transformer is a low resistance. This coil is a low resistance. But now you have a 180 ohm resistor. Then you have a 47K resistor with a capacitor to ground. Well, capacitors are open at DC. So this, for an ohmmeter, should, should show infinite uh, DC resistance. Then you go to this point, which goes through this capacitor to ground. Once again, that should be an open at DC. And then goes over to this capacitor, which once again should be an open at DC. So if you get anything other than extremely high resistance here, uh, and by extremely high I mean in the mega ohms, you know that there's something in this circuit, probably a capacitor that's shorted. We'll talk about capacitors at a point in the future, but for now we're a little bit over time again, and I hope that this uh, video will, will guide you in the direction. In the next episode we're going to talk about resistors, multimeters, and how to do these resistance checks and what you should get, uh, how to do it efficiently, etc. So I hope this has uh, given you some good information and that you've learned something, but if not, at least you've been entertained. So look forward to the next video and have a nice day.